Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> if you're like me at this time in the conference, um, you're beginning to think about going back home and uh, about all that free time that you have available to you back home. <laughs> right. Raise your hands if, you, if you've got an extra five hours uh, a week uh, that you can begin to apply everything that you've picked up here. Oh, so it may, you have more time, I guess, an extra 10 hours. <laughs> so I think I guessed right that you're busy. You have very, very busy lives. And um, how many are going back to uh, tense situations? Have you got kind of issues that are front and center that you're worried of how to deal with? So not only do you have busy lives, but there's, there's some, some things that are looming larger than others. Um, how many of you think of yourselves as leaders? Uh, okay, how many don't think of yourselves as leaders? <laughs> okay, about half of you raised your hand to say leaders, but you're not willing to raise your hand to say you may not be a leader. Um, um, there's a, <clears throat> an assumption that went into the design of this conference that went into, that goes into the design of all conferences that uh, Tamarack is associated with, which is that each of you are a leader not necessarily in the traditional sense uh, of a leader at the front of the room, uh, a leader that's in front of the parade or at the top of the pyramid. You, you may be. Um, but a leader who has the courage of their convictions, who has a sense of what the right thing to do is and, and finds a way to do it. There's this paradox in Canadian society. I don't know if our friends from New Zealand are still, are friends from New Zealand still here? Yeah, I don't know if you have this paradox in New Zealand or in America, but the public discourse is that we lack leaders. You have that, you know, that where have all the leaders gone? You know, I wish we had more ingenious, creative, bold political leaders is what they're saying. And, <clears throat> I kind of think it's the other way around, that we actually are entering a period, and I know this is the assumption of, of Tamarack, that we're entering a period not in which we are leaderless, but in which we're leaderful, in which each of us, in our own way, is redescribing, rearticulating, redefining what a leader is. And <clears throat> I'm reminded, the only research I did, you know, for today was to look at um, a notion that came from the Quakers in the 17th century, because I'm, I'm very curious about the Quakers. I don't know if you know, but probably the template for Saul Alinsky that John talked about, and for all radicals, and for all community organizers, was set by the Quakers in... Um, in the late 1700s in, uh, in the UK. 12 Quakers came together in a dusky, dusty, dark back room of a print shop in London and decided of all the bold things in the world to end, the slave, to end slavery. And that was at a time when statistically over 95% of the world was enslaved in one way or the other. So the water supply was moving in the opposite direction, was flowing in the opposite direction to what they wanted to do. And in less than 20 years, the slave trade was abolished in England. So the Quakers uh, in the 17th century thought of themselves as God's 
ordinaries. Those of you who came to the workshop yesterday know that I'm, I'm kind of perseverating these days on this phrase, the resurrection of the ordinary. And the Quakers thought of themselves as ordinary in the sense that extraordinary acts are not reserved for the special few, for the Hollywood actors who get awards for courage and valor because they play a role or for politicians, not that kind of special few, but ordinary in the sense that we are all born with the capacity to be brave, to be whistleblowers, to stretch a rule, to overcome our shame, to confess a wrong, to try another way, and another way, and another way, and another way, to reject evil conformity, and to defy immoral orders. So where I want to leave today is that I think all of the solutions, all of the inspiration, all of the techniques, all of the technology, all of the strategy, all of the policy, all of the programs that you heard yesterday and the day before and the day before are of no particular value unless they're in the hands of people whose courage is enlightened by their convictions. So we have, in that sense, high expectations of each other to see what we can do with what we've been thinking about here, which of course, every one of you, and we know this, right, from all the workshops we've attended with each other today and, or in the previous days, and which all of us are already doing. So we see this as our work. So how can we strengthen it? Because we are playing teeter-totter with an elephant. The flow of modern capitalist, consumer-driven North American society is headed in the exact opposite direction to what we've been talking about for the last three or four days, right? It's rushing in the exact opposite direction. So this has been a nice space. We're calm in a park setting, but we're not, you know, we're not fooled by that, right? We've got a job to do and it could be, could be very hard. So what I thought I'd do is just share, <clears throat> um, and if I have time, I'll, I'll get to six. I just put six points together last night. Just six ideas that I've noticed in others or that have helped me you know, survive in this turbulence to enable us to play teeter-totter with an elephant in an effective way without just staying on one end and just jumping up and down and say, look at me, look at me, look at me, but actually to be able to move some of these ideas back home into areas that we want to see them move to defy, in that sense, the status quo. The first thing I want to say is that we should not underestimate the power of imagination. And we know this, right? In the solace we seek when we think of Nelson Mandela, when we hear the tributes to him, or we imagine the life of Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma, giving up her family, not seeing her children for over 20 years, having her husband die in England and not being able to go see him because she stood with the Burmese people against the junta there. We know this when we tap into those people. They're fueled among all else by an ability to imagine a different world. Now, I don't want to steal the deep thoughts of Joseph, Joe yesterday when he talked about empathy, but it is this ability to not only uh, know and see what exists now, but to imagine what it would be like on the other side. Thomas Moore, so it's kind of a philosopher, theologer, said, it's my conviction that slight shifts in imagination have more impact on living 
than major efforts at change. And that's been my experience. You know, despite legislative success and policy success and funding success, if one isn't imagining the world in which community is thriving, then what is the point of all that policy? It won't survive. It'll be eroded. The soft or the sharp edges will be worn down. So I'll give you an example. How many of you have curbside recycling in your community, All right? So do you know that the concept of curbside recycling was imagined here in Kitchener-Waterloo? The world's first blue box program started here. Now think of this. There were dozens and dozens of books there were hundreds of ad campaigns. There was report after report after policy after regulation about recycling. And none of it was ma making a difference. So a bunch of really crazy people got together and they said, imagine this. And they said, let's paint a plastic box blue. Where'd that come from? And that did more than any of the policy, than any of the public education campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I'm getting at? Our work at PLAN, you heard Vicky yesterday, our work at PLAN obliged us to rethink the traditional definition of what it meant to have a disability. And we imagined a different world. We said, eventually, that the two biggest handicaps faced by people with disability were their poverty and their social isolation. You took care of them, disability would take care of itself. This kind of imagination, rethinking, reframing. There was a large tract of land on the west coast of Canada. It was known as Timber Tree Farm License Number 42 and Timber Tree Farm License Number 43. It was the largest tract of northern temperate rainforest in the world. And they wanted to clear cut log it all. The environmentalists got together with labor leaders, with First Nations people, and nonprofit societies, and eventually with government. And you know what rallied them around it? A white garbage bear. The white Kermode bear was seen to be a nuisance bear in that territory because it went to the garbage dump all the time. And these people imagined this tract of land as the great bear rainforest. And all of it was protected by the government of British Columbia. And if you look at the maps of British Columbia now, it actually has a tract of land called the great bear rainforest, imagination rethinking, reframing. Second, second point. I don't think this is going to work for any of us, this community thing, if we're not in love with it. We have to be in love with it. What you discover is that there are things that are hurting what you love, who you love. There are entrapments, there are barriers, there are obstacles that are pinching on what and who you love. And so out of necessity, you do something about it. So I would say if you're not in love was some part of the community agenda, then maybe it's not your time to be working on it. But if you are in love, then the necessity is clear, isn't it? You know what they say, how does it go? Necessity is the mother of invention, eh? So if necessity is the mother of invention, then love is the father. 
or love and necessity are the parents of the kind of innovation that we're going to need to have the community agenda survive where we live. That makes sense? Let me tell you about somebody who embodies this. In those of you from Southern Ontario, there are likely schools named after Adelaide Hoodless. Yes? People familiar? Anybody know? How many people know who Adelaide Hoodless is? So very few of you. Oh my goodness. So, how many have seen the movie, the kind of comedy movie, Calendar Girl? You know about a group, more of you, eh? A group in England who raised money by posing, uh, women who pose nude and raised some money. Uh, well, this uh, group was uh, a branch of the Women's Institute. And the Women's Institute exists in 65 countries around the world. The Women's Institute has 70 million members today. The, William, the Women's Institute is credited with launching the first wave of feminism. The Women's Institute was founded in Stony Creek, Ontario by Adelaide Hoodless in 1897. And she founded the Women's Institute because her infant son, Jack, died two years before uh, from drink, drinking infected milk. And she decided to do something about it. Necessity and love are the mothers of invention. The third idea for you um, is an idea that goes back to uh, a man who's <clears throat> who influenced my life uh, quite profoundly, a man by the name of Paulo Ferreira. He's a Brazilian adult educator who was very popular in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And Vicky and I were just down in Brazil, and you just see the impact of the culture, the cultural impact of his thinking, his concepts on, on Brazil today. But he had a concept that he called free space. And he felt that our job was to find the free space in our institution, to find the free space in our organization, to not complain about management, to not allow the supervisor who's not interested to prevent us from doing what we want to do, but to find the free space, to create the free space. He can say it even further, and it's been my experience, is that there are more free spaces than organizations than you realize. And that we actually edit ourselves out of taking advantage of those free spaces. So I want to tell you about a guy. His name is Donald McPherson. He's a fiddle player from Cape Breton. And he was a street worker, a community worker, uh, in the downtown east side area of Vancouver. And he worked in the streets in the 80s and the 90s. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but in the 90s in Vancouver, in the downtown east side, um, there was an epidemic of... Uh, deaths caused by needle infections. In fact, it, uh, Vancouver was known at the time as the killing fields. Over 200 people a year were dying in our city. And Donald was working there, and Donald bonked. He lost all his energy. He had to leave. He couldn't. He was just, everything he tried to do was unsuccessful. So he took a leave of absence, and this was pre-internet days, and he heard about a concept called the safe injection site in, um, in uh, Switzerland. And he read a little bit about it, and he thought about it, and he thought, this could help us here. This could change the statistics on the number of people who are dying in the downtown east side. So when he went back to work, and he was working for the city of Vancouver, he told his boss, he was so excited about it, he was fresh, he had rested, and his boss said, I'm not interested in that. The mayor of Vancouver's policy was, lock them up, throw away the key, case closed. That was a literal quote from the mayor of Vancouver at the time. The mayor's name was Philip Owen. Donald tried again and again to convince his boss to consider uh, the safe injection site, and he refused, but he eventually conceded that Donald could have a leave of absence, a paid leave of absence to go to Switzerland to see the safe injection site, but he had to get there on his own hook. 
So Donald used the air miles of his sister. And he went there. And he said, I remember he described this to me. He says, I groped it out. You mean that any of science fiction readers out there read Robert Heinlein and the phrase, I groped it? He said, he got it immediately. He said, I saw it. I saw it. I saw what could happen. And he went back to Vancouver and he waited until his boss went on holidays. <laughs> and he arranged to go see the mayor. Now, you just don't do that in Vancouver, right? Any of you who work for municipal government, you know how easy it is to get a, right, an appointment with the mayor? And within an hour, he had Mayor Philip Owen lock him up, throw away the key, on his knees, excited about the concept of four pillars drug strategy. So what Donald had done is he had identified all of the traditional approaches to dealing with people who are dependent on drugs. And then he had added a fourth pillar called harm reduction. And within that fourth pillar called harm reduction, he had smuggled in the safe injection site. Nobody dies in the downtown east side of Vancouver today as a result of drug overdoses or, or in, uh, taking infected needles. We have the only safe injection site in North America. And despite the attempts of the federal government to close it down, it still survives and thrives today. Further, you cannot be elected mayor of Vancouver. You cannot be appointed medical health officer or chief of police of Vancouver unless you agree to a safe injection site. It's got in the water supply. And let me tell you another part of the story. I had the pleasure to introduce Donald to another friend of mine, Adam Kahane who was employed by the Organization of American States three years ago, uh, the president of Colombia. You can imagine the drug trade in Colombia. The president of Colombia was the president of the Organization of American States, and they assigned Adam the task to come up with four alternative scenarios to ending the war on drugs policy, which is not working in Colombia, it's not working in Mexico, it's not working in America, and it's not working in Canada. And Donald became the chief advisor. Adam produced his report with the tacit, not public, but with the tacit support of both the American government and the Canadian government. And in 2016, this report with the four alternative scenarios to the war on drugs is going to the United Nations for a full and open discussion. Donald McPherson, Sisters Air Miles, bold enough to get an appointment with the mayor of Vancouver. Think of the impact. Free space. There's lots of them. Third point I want to talk about is a concept that my friend Jacques Dufresne, we had people here from uh, Victoriaville in Quebec. I don't think they're here now, are they? Community economic development folks have their head office in Victoria Will, Ville and the Eastern Townships now. Um, so Jacques is a good friend of Vicky's and mine, and he lives in the Eastern Townships. And he, uh, he has this phrase he calls moral oxygen. So if you were training for a marathon, or as some people I know, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, you would be probably hiking, biking, you might hire a fitness trainer to help you, you'd be very aware of your fitness. You might even train at altitude to kind of get used, you know, to the rigors of the, uh, of the hike that you're about to go on. So when we're confronted with a physical task, we understand that we have to prepare our bodies for it. Well, we're confronted with a psychic, moral, and ethical task this task of community, of deepening community. And where is your moral oxygen? We have to pay attention to our moral oxygen. Now, there are a number of people who lead campaigns who actually are not only smart tacticians and strategists, 
but actually they pay attention to their moral oxygen. So the leaders of the Great Bear Rainforest were all women. And uh, they went uh, on a regular basis to retreats at Hollyhock, which is on an island up the coast of British Columbia, off the coast of British Columbia. And they, they took workshops with, um, is it Robert Glass, Gass, Robert Gass? And they, they essentially focused on loving kindness meditation because they were in deep negotiation with forest companies. And they understood that if they let their anger and their rage and their righteousness jump on to the table, that they could never negotiate the kind of you know, settlement that they wanted for the Great Bear Rainforest. So there was one particular tense moment during the negotiations when one of the women was doing the lead, and this woman is Sephora Berman. Many of you may have heard her, of her. She's, um, she's been with Greenpeace. She's now going to lead the campaign to stop the pipeline flowing from northern Alberta to the coast of British Columbia. And um, she, um, she was across the table from a negotiator, a man, a middle-aged man who was just pulling all her strings and she was getting more and more outraged and people could see her other colleagues around her could just see that you know what was going to boil up was something that could actually set them back months if not years and so one of them uh, got a piece of paper and just wrote on the paper breathe and passed it over to Sapara and that was enough she stepped back a little bit figuratively and breathed and drew on her moral oxygen. So what is your moral oxygen? Where do you get it? Is it from cycling, from yoga, from meditation? We have in this room, I suspect, many, many experts at moral oxygen. But one of them is my buddy, Ted Kuntz. Ted, why don't you stand up? Ted's written, I don't know if you know, this man will be speaking at this event in front like this next year, I'm sure. Um, but this man has written a book called Peace Begins With Me, and it's all about moral oxygen. And uh, when we do our little circle later on, Ted, I hope you come up and, and join us. But Michael, who plays the piano and who spoke and who people heard yesterday, is another uh, expert at moral oxygen. There are many more in this room. How many people here consider themselves to be um, exponents, um, experts may not be the right word, but who un deeply understand moral oxygen. Beautiful, beautiful. So we need your help, those of us who kind of are fueled more by moral righteousness. The last point um, I want to make um, is that, and we hear this all the time, and it's so easy to say, but it's true. And it's so true that we have to keep saying it until we go deeper than just saying it, which is this notion of working together. If all that happens at this event is that we all agree that we should deepen community, we will not have much impact. The impact will happen when we reach out to people who we've betrayed, who've betrayed us, who've hurt us, who we don't know, and therefore make lots of assumptions about, um, and who have in some way uh, become to epitomize our opponents, our, our enemies. We have to create what um, First Nations people call a spirit canoe. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work of one person, but while I'm doing that, if any of you brought your wallet with you um, and can find a $20 bill, not the current $20 bill, but the, the one before the current plastic version of the $20 bill, I wouldn't mind you getting it out, and I'm going to ask you to, to look at a piece of that $20 bill in a minute. But I want to tell you about Claudia... <clears throat> It's not necessary for you to do it, but if you have it, it would be great. I, I'm, I need to get home, and I don't, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have enough money. I, sp I spent it all on 
t-shirts. Um, I want to tell you about Claudia Lee. This is a woman in Vancouver who is, I don't know, Vicky, maybe 26, 27, and she's got the wisdom of an elder. She runs an organization called Shark Truth. And her intention was to reduce the numbers of sharks that are killed so that their fins can be used in shark fin soup. Now, you can tell by her last name that Claudia is Asian. And she looked at the number of campaigns going on around North America to reduce the use of shark fins in shark fin soups. And she saw the aftermath of these campaigns is that they left bitter and divided communities along race lines. I believe this is true in Toronto. So there was a regulat regulatory approach to prohibiting the use of shark fins in shark fin soup in Toronto. And the divide was Asians on one side, smug, white, uh, non-Asian people on the other side. And Claudia was interested in creating a movement of environmentalists among Asian people. She was starting with shark fins, but she wanted to enlist them in, in effect, the community, deepening community movement in the environmental movement in her case. And so what she did was she invented alternatives to shark fins uh, used in traditional dishes because she understood that when you have shark fin soup, it's largely in celebration of some momentous event in your family. And it is when you are at your most gracious and your most hospitable. And people who were arguing against the use of shark fins were arguing against, they were pitting themselves against this ancient heritage of conviviality, of celebration, of hospitality, and of generation. And you could see why people's backs were up. So she worked with all the leading chefs in Vancouver and with all the leading food producers and has found a way to significantly reduce the use of shark fins and shark fin soups. So now it's culturally appropriate if you're getting married in the Asian community in Vancouver to have a vegetarian option to shark fins in your wedding. She worked with the catering company so that they offered this as an option. Does that make sense? You see, I kind of the flip. What Claudia was doing was she was creating the spirit canoe, wasn't she? She was creating a way in which not only can they deal with the immediate issue, but they could also uh, enlist people from the Asian community, because they know statistically that they are the least involved in the environmental movement in Vancouver. Vancouver, in many ways, is the home of environmental activism. Greenpeace was invented there. And yet, the participation of Asian people is very minimal. So Claudia now has created a new organization whose ma major intent is to enroll and list the power of Asian people as environmentalists to save our oceans. Isn't that a beautiful story? A beautiful story. So the only thing I want to leave you with is that in, in our country, <clears throat> we have a symbol. Oh, if, I want to say uh, one more thing. Um, this notion of working together is a lot of rhetoric on the surface. Uh, I, I am currently working for a group of a collaboration called Social Innovation Generation. And um, um, its intent is to um, ignite uh, an awareness of the potential of social innovation to help us solve our toughest social and environmental challenges. So we wanted to, in effect, ignite a culture of a renaissance of social problem solving in Canada. We wanted to bring out the best in Canadians. And we brought out the worst in each other. I have never worked in circumstances in which I have seen more bullying. I have never pouted through more meetings in my life than at the meetings that we used to have. I resigned twice, um, you know, as a result of what was happening. We were, we brought out the worst in each other in our attempt to bring out the best in Canadians. And the reason for that is that it's easy to talk about 
working together. Um, it's very hard work. It's even harder. We think it's going to be harder with our opponents, but it's actually as hard to do with our friends and allies because this work leads us into the unknown. And this is the point, is we don't know what our destination is. I personally think we're up against incredible forces. As I said earlier, we're playing teeter-totter with an elephant. These are very powerful technology forces, media forces, habits and mindsets that, you know, that we've allowed to sink into our psyche over generations. And here we are talking about deepening community, you know. And um, so uh, the solutions to this are not that evident. It's almost dialogical. You almost have to invest in a dialogue, as Paul will talk a little bit more after the break. Um, so that's why strategies aren't that helpful. The strategies assume that you're going from A to B. But I think we're going from A to maybe. We're not 100% sure. We know what we want, we can imagine it, but the actual hows are not as clear. So the reason I asked you to take out the $20 bill <clears throat> is that on the back of that canoe is the a jade canoe of Bill Reed, or uh, the spirit canoe, uh, as some of us like to, to call it. And in that canoe, if you look at the back of the canoe, as I've talked to Haida people about this, in that canoe are people who don't like each other. In that, in that canoe are people who have done bad things to each other in the past, included, uh, including attempting to maim or disfigure uh, each other. In that canoe are people who uh, don't know each other, and yet they're on the ocean, and the waves are tumbling over them, and they know that the only way they're going to survive is by working together, despite their ignorance of each other, despite what they've done to each other, despite their friendships or not. And that, I think, is our ultimate task, is to figure out a way in our organizations to create a metaphorical spirit canoe or container or vehicle that involves people inside your organizations and people outside their organizations. It involves the extension of the hand of trust on your part because it may be that you are the one that has to start the trust revolution. You are the one that has to say, I know he's hurt me before, but in order for us to get out of this perilous spot, we're gonna to have to figure out a way to work together. So I'll just leave you by um, uh, uh, the wish that you find a way in your organizations to create a spirit canoe and you let us know what your canoe looks like. And I wanna tell you the final secret of a spirit canoe. In a spirit canoe, there is always room for one more. Thank you very much.